Uh, this week we're going to be talking about success and that's a big thing if you have live in america you probably have noticed we're in one of the most successful nations of all time now i think that affects us not only as a culture but it also affects us as an individual what would you say is successful to you would it be money would it be respect would it be a good career would it be being a good parent now you take all of these things and you say i don't have all these examples of what it means to be uh, a success in this world i think you do and I think every one of us has our own criteria of what success is. And if I would just let you write it down and go in the corner and say, what would be success to you? I think you could do it. Assuming no one else would see it, you could write down, this is what success means. Now take that list. Would you say, based on that list, Jesus was a success in this world? As far as power, he, had the, he fought against the politicians of his day, and they killed him. As far as money, he didn't even own a house. He didn't have a place to lay his head. As far as friends and popularity, he was popular for a while. He even had a sermon where literally everybody left except his 12 disciples. From a worldly perspective, Jesus was not successful, but I think if we just step back and say, was Jesus successful? We'd say, absolutely, he was, based on his purpose. This is what it says in Philippians. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So my question to you is this. What is success in your life? I don't think it's trying to get results. God doesn't give us results that you should have this much money or this kind of house or this kind of thing in your life. God wants us to live according to the purpose he has given us. And God has given you a purpose, and obviously God has given Christ a purpose, which was, in his omniscience, God saw a world that needed saving, a world that included you. And God says, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go all the way to the cross, and I'm going to succeed at saving the world. That includes you. Let's pray. Uh, dear Jesus, you are so successful. Living in this world is so hard and we have so many things that we compare ourselves to. We want success on so many different levels. Help us find our true purpose, which is living for you and let the results take care of themselves. Help us live for the way that you designed us. You know that we know that you have a plan set out for us. Help us live in that plan and be someone who can live in people's life to share the ultimate message of the greatest success of all time. You came to this world to take sins away. We ask this in your name, amen. We're talking about success this week, and there is a hot new term, I think, for 2018. It's not new, obviously, because it's 2019, but the term is this, lawnmower parents. The idea or the premise is this, that parents so want their kids to avoid obstacles, challenges, and failure that they mow down any obstacle or challenge or failure in their way. Now, I see this happen. I get to teach Latin about once a week at the local school, and you're thinking, yeah, it's a dead language, I get it. So I teach Latin once a week, but I go by a cart where parents drop off the things they forget for their students and they leave it there for them to deliver to the rest of the day. I have a nickname for that cart and the staff actually put the name on the cart one day and it said the cart of irresponsibility. And we all thought it was kind of funny and I couldn't believe they actually put it on the cart because as you can imagine, parents complained. So I'm thinking, okay, I can't do that to my kids. I have to make them responsible. I have to have them you know, accomplish things and go through difficulties. However, I feel this as a parent. New Year's Eve, just last year, I sat down with my kids and we talked through like the greatest things of the year. We talk about highs, we talk about lows, how did it make them feel? And ironically, or not ironically, because we're parents that love our kids, the lows for both Amy and I included when my kids struggled. It is hard as a parent that loves someone to see them struggle and to see them fail and to see them work through things. That was one of my top three low points for my, for my life because it happened to my kids. It was the top three low points for my wife's life because of what happened to my kids. So wh where do we get and where do we go with all this stuff? A couple things. Failure is absolutely inevitable. And you look at the life of Job, he says our life is full of trouble. And you look at what Jesus says as he sends out his disciples. If people do not welcome you, leave their towns and shake off the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. So one says, he said, you're going to go to a town and people aren't going to listen. What should you do? What is he doing? He's preparing them for failure. Failure is inevitable, even if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Number two, 
failure often leads to good things. There's someone who's really smart who said something like this, failure is on the same road as success, it's just a little bit earlier. And I think that's totally true. You can look at the greatest basketball players, how many shots they miss. You can look at how much trouble and how much Abraham Lincoln failed at elections. And for crying out loud, Clorox bleach took 409 tries to get the right cleaner. So I mean, it takes effort to get something of substance. So how do we help out as people that love our kids? We can't mow down all the obstacles. Instead, I think we just help them fight through failures and make sure that they don't become a failure. And when you give in to all the failures, you're a failure, and that's not our job. Our job is to encourage and correct and push and strive so that they can succeed at the things they're trying to do. And finally, I think failure is good, actually, instead of success all the time because it puts our world in perspective. We don't live in heaven. And we're going to face trouble all the time. Inevitably, we're going to fail and we're going to be frustrated. Sometimes that leads to a better place. And I think it also puts perspective in what kind of God we have. Jesus came to this earth and did he ever fail once? Not once. Even going to the cross to take your sins away, to pay for all our sinful failures, and to build us up so that we can live for him in so many ways. And we can come around and support the people that we love and help them so that they can battle past failures and strive in this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know failure is inevitable. We just don't like it. We want to succeed at all the things we do. We want all things to go well. We want all smooth things for our own lives, but we also want this for the lives of the people we care about. Help us step back and recognize the importance of struggle and the importance of fighting through things so that they can grow as human beings and they can grow as people and we can be people who come alongside them, not the ones who pick them up and carry them because ultimately you're the only one who can carry us. So help, let us rest in your arms knowing that you are always there for us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Uh, we're talking about success, and a lot of times we talk about the struggle of not succeeding, but what happens if you do? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So success is difficult, I think, because different cultures, different families, different nations have ideas of what success really is. My definition would be simply this, aligning my plan with God's plan and living my life with purpose, not just for results. So when you say something like that, the assumption is, well, Christians must never succeed. Well, that's not true at all. I know countless Christian athletes. I know countless Christian CEOs and owners of companies. And I know people who are uh, Christian who are really, really wealthy. So what does that mean? When I hear that people are successful and God has blessed them, in my heart, there's part of me that says, man, I wish I was at the top of my field and I wish I could buy or do those things. But most of me thinks that's got to be really, really hard. Because when you talk about what our identity is naturally, most of the time, it's what we're good at. And if God has blessed you with the ability to work, God has blessed you with the ability to sports, God has blessed you as an actor or an actress, that becomes your identity. A smarter pastor than I am said it something like this. He said, when your work or your success becomes your identity instead of Christ, that means your success goes to your head and your failures go to your heart. And I can't imagine how hard it would be to struggle and not think, I'm pretty awesome. I'm pretty amazing. And the very blessings that God has given you disconnect you from the God who has given them to you. It's for this reason when we look in Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is God's warning to the people as they enter the promised land. This is a little bit longer, so stick with me. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise... When you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and your flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. So what's my prayer to you? You might just be in the most successful time in your life with relationships and work and school, but hold on to Christ and don't forget the Lord because no matter how God takes you and how far God takes you, they'll always be there with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, some of us are struggling and some of us are in a point of success. Help us in our success to always look to you, the one who has given us these blessings, and help us to live with purpose with these blessings so that we can be a person that people look up to as one who has taken blessings and not let them go to our head or not let the, the failures go to our heart. Instead, we know our identity. Our identity is strictly with you, not in our success. We ask this in your name. 
This week we're talking about success and what is one tip that I would give you if you want to be successful while well, I was reading an article about businesses in the United States. If you did not know this, 500,000, 500,000, half a million businesses open every single month. Of those within two years, and I don't know if it's like the adrenaline or people just keep going, 66% will still be open, so 33% closed. And by the time you get to the five-year point, half of them done. So I see this anecdotally as I function. Our church is downtown in Castle Rock in Colorado. And I was talking to a friend. There's a brewery that's there. And the brewery closed after less than two years. And I said, okay, what's, what's the deal? I never went there. And he runs a very successful brewery. And he said, okay, there's three things. This is my insider baseball. Three things. Number one, they're not very nice. That's pretty, that makes sense. Number two, they only made English style ales, I think it is, which is basically saying our taste should be your taste. Deal with it. That doesn't help. And three, after you give him all this advice about decorating and how to do things and what would make sense of, about design in the brewery, he didn't do any of it. I would say that's not enough courage to listen to the truth. This is how the Bible says it. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. So what do businesses have to do with us? My guess is that you're struggling with something, and I'm wondering if you have the courage to admit to someone you need help. Maybe it's struggling to be a parent. And maybe it's struggling at work and you're afraid and you don't have the courage to say, I need some help here. Maybe it's struggling with alcohol or drugs and you don't have the courage to seek out some help. Maybe it's struggling in your marriage and you're not going to counselors or reading books or working together to get closer. The way of fools seems right to them. And I'm sure we have all kinds of excuses why we're not doing it, but the wise listen to it. On a deeper level, let me ask you this. This is really what our relationship is built on with God. It's not about businesses, it's not about success, but it's saying, do you have the courage to lay bare your whole life before God and say, this is how I've lived. How does this line up with you? Because our greatest success is not how we do in the world. It's not even how we do as a parent. Our greatest success is how we line up with Christ. So we confess the things we have done, we hear God's forgiveness, and then we're empowered to live differently. And that's success. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask you one thing. Give us the courage to lay our life bare before you, trust in your promises, and live the way that you've called us to live. Amen. Uh, we're talking about success this week and all kinds of things that have been going great. And you might be saying, oh, listen, that is not my life. And the way that you can test this is someone probably asked you recently, hey, how's it going? And you might have said, like, fine. But in your mind, you're thinking, eh. I spilled coffee on myself this morning and the dog's been a pain and the kids aren't doing great in school and I'm going through a divorce and my relationship's not going great. All these things kind of add up. And my question is, how do you handle when life isn't very successful? I think there's stuff we can do, to be honest. Uh, we could self-medicate and we can get drunk. We could eye guzzle Netflix. We could uh, go buy some stuff because it makes me feel better. We could talk down about other people because that makes me feel better too. But here's the issue. All of these solutions for our problems are just temporary, right? Eventually you sober up. Eventually you gotta pay the credit card bill for the stuff you bought. Eventually people find out what you said about them. You know, all these things tumble. What if we just shift it? And instead of looking at our immediate circumstance to determine if we're doing okay right now, we step back and we look at how God looks at us. And this is how it's described in Romans chapter eight. I'm convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, and I would actually add right there, success or failure is going to separate you from the love of Christ. So when God looks at you, he says, I don't care if you've made mistakes. He says, I don't care if you're the most successful person in the world. Those things don't matter to me. God does not have a measure. God's only measure is that through faith in Christ, he sees you as his child. Now think about that. When someone says, how's it going? I'd say it's going pretty great. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just simply thank you that you have made us a success through faith in Christ, not in this world's terms, but in your terms. One that says we are, home, uh, we are holy and we are blameless and will stand before you. We ask this in Jesus' name, who made us holy and blameless. Amen. Did you enjoy this video? Uh, if so, we would love to share even more Jesus with you, even if you have a busy, on-the-go kind of life. Uh, just click here and you can find the audio version for this podcast along with all the other podcasts that Time of Grace offers.